A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, Section 46. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Thousand Miles Up the Nile by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 16. Abu Simbel, Part 1. We came to Abu Simbel on the night of the 31st of January, and we left at sunset on the 18th of February. Of these eighteen clear days we spent fourteen at the foot of the rock of the great temple, called in the old Egyptian tongue the Rock of Abshek. The remaining four, taken at the end of the first week and the beginning of the second, were passed in the excursion to Wadi Halfa and back. By thus dividing the time, our long sojourn was made less monotonous for those who had no especial work to do. Meanwhile it was wonderful to wake every morning close under the steep bank, and without lifting one's head from the pillow, to see that row of giant faces so close against the sky. They showed unearthly enough by moonlight, but not half so unearthly as in the gray of dawn. At that hour, the most solemn of the twenty-four, they wore a fixed and fatal look that was little less than appalling. As the sky warmed, this awful look was succeeded by a flush that mounted and deepened like the rising flush of life. For a moment they seemed to glow, to smile, to be transfigured. Then came a flash, as of thought itself. It was the first instantaneous flash of the risen sun. It lasted less than a second. It was gone almost before one could say that it was there. The next moment, mountain, river, and sky were distinct in the steady light of day, and the colossi, mere colossi now, sat serene and stony in the open sunshine. Every morning I waked in time to witness that daily miracle. Every morning I saw those awful brethren pass from death to life, from life to sculptured stone. I brought myself almost to believe, at last, that there must sooner or later come some one sunrise when the ancient charm would snap asunder, and the giants must arise and speak. Stupendous as they are, nothing is more difficult than to see the colossi properly. Standing between the rock and the river, one is too near. Stationed on the island opposite, one is too far off, while from the sand slope only a side view is obtainable. Hence, for want of a fitting standpoint, many travellers have seen nothing but deformity in the most perfect face handed down to us by Egyptian art. One recognizes in it the Negro, and one the Mongolian type, while another admires the fidelity with which the Nubian characteristics have been seized. Yet in truth the head of the young Augustus is not cast in a loftier mould. These statues are portraits, portraits of the same man four times repeated, and that man is Ramesses the Great. Now Ramesses the Great, if he was as much like his portraits as his portraits are like each other, must have been one of the handsomest men, not only of his day, but of all history. Wheresoever we meet with him, whether in the fallen Colossus at Memphis, or in the Sinai torso of the British Museum, or among the innumerable bas-reliefs of Thebes, Abydos, Gorna, and Bat el his features, though bearing in some instances the impress of youth and in others of maturity, are always the same. The face is oval, the eyes are long, prominent, and heavy-lidded, the nose is slightly aquiline and characteristically depressed at the tip, the nostrils are open and sensitive, the under lip projects, the chin is short and square. Here, for instance, is an outline from a bas-relief at Beit el Weli. The subject is commemorative of the king's first campaign. A beardless youth fired with the rage of battle, he clutches a captive by the hair and lifts his mace to slay. In this delicate and Dantesque face, which lacks as yet the fullness and repose of the later portraits, we recognize all the distinctive traits of the older Ramesses. Here again is a sketch from Abydos, in which the king, although he has not yet ceased to wear the side-lock of youth, is seen with a boyish beard, and looks some three or four years older than in the previous portrait. It is interesting to compare these heads with the accompanying profile of one of the carotid colossi inside the great temple of Abu Simbel, and all three with one of the giant portraits of the façade. 
This last, whether regarded as a marvel of size or of portraiture, is the chef d'oeuvre of Egyptian sculpture. We, we here see the great king in his prime. His features are identical with those of the head at Beit el Weli, but the contours are more amply filled in, and the expression is altogether changed. The man is full fifteen or twenty years older. He has outlived that rage of early youth. He is no longer impulsive, but implacable. A godlike serenity, an almost superhuman pride, an immutable will, breathe from the sculptured stone. He has learned to believe his prowess irresistible, and himself almost divine. If he now raised his arm to slay, it would be with the stern placidity of a destroying angel. The annexed woodcut gives the profile of the southernmost colossus, which is the only perfect, or very near perfect, one of the four. The original can be correctly seen from but one point of view, and that point is where the sand slope meets the northern buttress of the façade, at a level just parallel with the beards of the statues. It was thence that the present outline was taken. The sand slope is steep and loose and hot to the feet. More disagreeable climbing it would be hard to find even in Nubia, but no traveller who refuses to encounter this small hardship need believe that he has seen the faces of the Colossi. Viewed from below, this beautiful portrait is foreshortened out of all proportion. It looks unduly wide from ear to ear, while the lips and lower part of the nose show relatively larger than the rest of the features. The same may be said of the great cast in the British Museum. Cooped up at the end of a narrow corridor and lifted not more than fifteen feet above the ground, it is carefully placed so as to be wrong from every point of view and shown to the greatest possible disadvantage. The artist who wrought the original statues were, however, embarrassed by no difficulties of focus, daunted by no difficulties of scale. Giants themselves, they summoned these giants from out of the solid rock, and endowed them with superhuman strength and beauty. They sought no quarried blocks of cyanite or granite for their work. They fashioned no models of clay. They took a mountain and fell upon it like titans and hollowed and carved it as though it were a cherry stone and left it for the feebler men of after ages to marvel at forever. One great hall and fifteen spacious chambers they hewed out from the heart of it, then smoothed the rugged precipice towards the river and cut four huge statues with their faces to the sunrise, two to the right and two to the left of the doorway, there to keep watch to the end of time. These tremendous warders sit sixty-six feet high, without the platform under their feet. They measure across the chest twenty-five feet and four inches, from the shoulder to the elbow fifteen feet and six inches, from the inner side of the elbow joint to the tip of the middle finger fifteen feet, and so on in relative proportion. If they stood up, they would tower to a height of at least eighty-three feet, from the soles of their feet to the tops of their enormous double crowns. Nothing in Egyptian sculpture is perhaps quite so wonderful as the way in which these Abu Simbel artists dealt with the thousands of tons of material to which they here gave human form. Consummate masters of effect, they knew precisely what to do and what to leave undone. These were portrait statues. Therefore they finished the heads up to the highest point consistent with their size. But the trunk and the lower limbs they regarded from a decorative rather than a statuesque point of view. As a decoration it was necessary that they should give size and dignity to the façade. Everything, consequently, was here subordinated to the general effect of breadth, of massiveness, of repose. Considered thus, the Colossi are a triumph of treatment. Side by side they sit, placid and majestic, their feet a little apart, their hands resting on their knees. Shapely though they are, those huge legs look scarcely inferior in girth to the great columns of Karnak. The articulations of the knee joint, the swell of the calf, the outline of the peroneus longus are indicated rather than developed. The toenails and toe joints are given in the same bold and general way, but the fingers, because only the tips of them could be seen from below, are treated en bloc. Their faces show the same largeness of style, the little dimple which gives such sweetness to the corners of the mouth, 
and the tiny depression in the lobe of the ear are in fact circular cavities as large as saucers. How far this treatment is consistent with the most perfect delicacy and even finesse of execution may be gathered from the sketch. The nose there shown in profile is three feet and a half in length. The mouth so delicately curved is about the same in width. Even the sensitive nostril, which looks ready to expand with the breath of life, exceeds eight inches in length. The ear, which is placed high and is well detached from the head, measures three feet and five inches from top to tip. A recent writer who brings sound practical knowledge to bear upon the subject is of opinion that the Egyptian sculptors did not even point their work beforehand. If so, then the marvel is only so much the greater. The men who, working in so coarse and friable a material, could not only give beauty and finish to heads of that size, but could with barbaric tools hew them out ab initio from the natural rock, were the Michelangelos of their age. It has already been said that the last Ramesses to the southward is the best preserved. His left arm and hand are injured, and the head of the Uraeus sculptured on the front of the Pshent is gone. But with these exceptions the figure is whole, as fresh in surface, as sharp in detail, as on the day it was completed. The next is shattered to the waist. His head lies at his feet, half buried in sand. The third is nearly as perfect as the first, while the fourth has lost not only the whole beard and the greater part of the uraeus, but has both arms broken away and a big cavernous hole in the front of the body. From the double crowns of the two last, the top ornament is also missing. It looks a mere knob, but it measures eight feet in height. Such an effect does the size of these four figures produce on the mind of the spectator that he scarcely observes the fractures they have sustained. I do not remember to have even missed the head and body of the shattered one, though nothing is left of it above the knees. Those huge legs and feet covered with ancient inscriptions, some of Greek, some of Phoenician origin, tower so high above the heads of those who look at them from below that one scarcely thinks of looking higher still. The figures are naked to the waist and clothed in the usual striped tunic. On their heads they wear the double crown and on their necks rich collars of cabochon drops cut in very low relief. The feet are bare of sandals and the arms of bracelets, but in the front of the body, just where the customary belt and buckle would come, are deep holes in the stone, such as might have been made to receive rivets, supposing the belts to have been made of bronze or gold. On the breast, just below the necklace, and on the upper part of each arm, are cut in magnificent ovals, between four and five feet in length, the ordinary cartouches of the king. These were probably tattooed upon his person in the living flesh. Some have supposed that these statues were originally colored, and that the color may have been effaced by the ceaseless shifting and blowing of the sand. Yet the drift was probably at its highest when Burckhardt discovered the place in 1813, and on the two heads that were still above the surface he seems to have observed no traces of color. Neither can the keenest eye detect any vestige of that delicate film of stucco with which the Egyptians invariably prepared their surfaces for painting. Perhaps the architects were for once content with the natural color of the sandstone, which is here very rich and varied. It happens also that the colossi come in a light-colored vein of the rock, and so sit relieved against a darker background. Towards noon, when the level of the façade has just passed into shade and the sunlight still strikes upon the statues, the effect is quite startling. The whole thing, which is then best seen from the island, looks like a huge onyx cameo cut in high relief. A statue of Ra, to whom the temple is dedicated, stands some twenty feet high in a niche over the doorway, and is supported on either side by a bas-relief portrait of the king in an attitude of worship. Next above these comes a superb hieroglyphic inscription reaching across the whole front. Above the inscription, a band of royal cartouches. Above the cartouches, a frieze of sitting apes. Above the apes, last and highest, some fragments of a cornice. The height of the whole may have been somewhat over a hundred feet. Wherever it has been possible to introduce them as decoration, 
we see the ovals of the king. Under those sculptured on the platforms and over the door, I observed the hieroglyphic character nub, which in conjunction with the sign known as the determinative of metals signifies gold, nub, but when represented as here without the determinative, stands for Nubia, the land of gold. This addition, which I do not remember to have seen elsewhere in connection with the cartouches of Ramesses II, is here used in an heraldic sense as signifying the sovereignty of Nubia. The relative position of the two temples of Abu Simbel has been already described, how they are excavated in two adjacent mountains and divided by a cataract of sand. The front of the small temple lies parallel to the course of the Nile, here flowing in a north-easterly direction. The façade of the great temple is cut in the flank of the mountain and faces due east. Thus the colossi, towering above the shoulder of the sand drift, catch, as it were, a side view of the small temple and confront vessels coming up the river. As for the sand drift, it curiously resembles the glacier of the Rhone. In size, in shape, in position, in all but color and substance, it is the same. Pent in between the rocks at the top, it opens out like a fan at the bottom. In this, its inevitable course, it slants downward across the facade of the great temple. Forever descending, drifting, accumulating, it wages the old stealthy war, and, unhasting, unresting, labors grain by grain to fill the hollowed chambers, and bury the great statues, and wrap the whole temple in a winding sheet of golden sand, so that the place thereof shall know it no more. It had very nearly come to this when Burckhardt went up, A.D. 1813. The top of the doorway was then thirty feet below the surface. Whether the sand will ever reach that height again must depend on the energy with which it is combated. It can only be cleared as it accumulates. To avert it is impossible. Backed by the illimitable wastes of the Libyan desert, the supply from above is inexhaustible. Come it must, and come it will, to the end of time. The drift rose to the lap of the northernmost colossus and halfway up the legs of the next when the filet lay at Abu Simbel. The doorway was clear, however, almost to the threshold, and the sand inside was not more than two feet deep in the first hall. The whole façade, we were told, had been laid bare, and the interior swept and garnished when the Empress of the French, after opening the Suez Canal in 1869, went up the Nile as far as the Second Cataract. By this time, most likely, that yellow carpet lies thick and soft in every chamber, and is fast silting up the doorway again. End of section 46